start to Psalm 32, verse 5. Psalm 32. David is talking here. No. He says, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. I want to ask you one question from that, from that scripture. Did the psalmist change his future by confessing his sin? Yes, he did. Unconfessed, that sin would have been a way, the sin is like a cancer that eats at you. That's what sin unconfessed is. Everybody said he changed his future by confessing his sin. Now to be clear, you need to note that simply confessing your sin is not enough. Proverbs 28, 13 explains the part that David assumed we knew. It's actually two parts to getting rid of sin. I love Proverbs, they're so clear. It says, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and does what? Forsakes. Now, if some people have the attitude, I may go get drunk every day of my life, but as long as I say I'm sorry at the end of it, or I can, oh my goodness, I'm telling the truth up here. There's more to getting rid of sin than confessing it at the end of the day. David said, I will confess my sin to the Lord, but he also assumed we knew that that meant turning away from sin. Repentance really does not mean saying you're sorry. Repentance does not mean coming around the altar and crying. Repentance means turn around and go the way. If I'm going this way and I just repent, that means, okay, I've repented because I turned around and went the other way. So the, the, the guy who wrote the Proverbs, probably Solomon, said, he who conceals his transgressions won't prosper, but if you confess them, and forsake them, you'll find compassion. How many of you need compassion from God? Yeah. That means blessing and blessing and blessing. Compassion comes with blessing. Now we know good and well that confessing sin can, break, can make an evening bright. Have you ever said, oh honey, I'm so sorry. And you change your future by just saying you're sorry. Okay, I thought that was funny. Okay. So in the Old Testament, if I went, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about confession tonight because I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding about the power of confession. In the Old Testament, the word confess does deal primarily with sin. And it's also mentioned in the New Testament. We confess our sins. But the Isaiah the prophet, if you'll go to Isaiah 26, verse 13, introduces a new concept. A lot of people cannot imagine how the words of their mouth could affect their future. But I'm trying to make it real clear tonight. The words of your mouth not only affect your future, they determine your future. The words of your mouth determine whether you're going to go to hell or to heaven. Now here he introduces a new concept. It's really a New Testament concept. Isaiah was the most New Testament prophet there was. We're in verse 13, 26, 13. O Lord, our God, other masters besides you have ruled us, but through you alone we confess what? Your name. He's confessing who his God is. And you say, does that matter? Yeah, who your God is makes a whole lot of difference. You've got a good God, you've got a great life, and if you don't, you've got problems. Please notice two things. David talked about changing your life through the confession of sin. Isaiah also speaks of changing your life. Which master rules over? He said, we've had many master rules over, you, over us, but now we confess your name. Hallelujah. If you listen to some people, now this might sound hard, but you know it's true. If you listen to people, you can find out who their God is. If you listen to some people, they talk about money so much, you know good and well money is their God. But well, we don't want to do that. We want to establish the Lordship. If we establish the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our lives, that means not only do we get his covering, but we get his blessings. Now, are you ready to take this verse in the Old Testament? This is a word study tonight, but I hope you get something out of it. Go to Romans 10, 9, because Paul says the same thing. Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now, here's a question. 
If you put your hands on your hips and say, Jesus is not my Lord, and you hold that stance for the rest of your life, will you go to heaven or hell? Oh. You go to hell. But if you bow your knees with your heart, and you say, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life, and you are my God and my covering, what happens? You get all the blessings of God because of this. You change your life with your confession. And you say, isn't this pretty simple? A lot of people don't understand. You get your healing the same way. Yeah. You hold fast your confession. Now, I would ask you, would, would you let somebody make you say, uh, Muhammad is God's prophet and all is God? How many of you would say that for any amount of money? No. no. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that great is the reward of your confession. Hold fast the confession for great is its reward. Your reward for holding fast the confession of the Lord Jesus Christ is heaven in all eternity. But your reward is holding fast to the confession of your healing is healing. You're, okay, hold on. You see, the moment I say that, you say, well, I can see it for salvation, but I don't know. I want, this is the scripture that this message came from. Go to Matthew 10, 32. This is absolutely fascinating. I've heard Brother Copeland say this. and You ever see something in scriptures and you think, how in the world did I never have thought that before or observed that before? Matthew 10, Jesus is teaching. In verse 32, he says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, is confession important? Real. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So if you say, Jesus is my Lord. What did Jesus say to the Father in heaven? He says, Jesus is her Lord. If someone were to say, he's not my Lord and never will be, what does he confess before the Father? He says, no, I'm not their Lord so far. No, I'm not. He'll never say never until you're gone. He'll always believe for you. Okay. But he says about you exactly what you said. Now, this is what Brother Copeland said. I said, no, nah, how could I have missed this? Who is Jesus Christ is the living word made flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, when he says, if we could go back a verse, could you read this verse this way? Therefore, everyone who confesses the living word before men, I will confess him before the fathers in heaven. In other words, if you before men say, okay, I don't look too healed tonight, but Matthew 8, 17, you know what it says? It says, he himself took my infirmities and carried my diseases, and I believe the living word. Whoever confesses the living word before men, Jesus said, I will confess him in the living word before God. Whatever you say about you is exactly what you get. First of all, it starts with salvation, but you can use this for protection. Yeah. I, the reason I'm trying to get this across tonight, people really don't think that the words of their mouth matter. And yet... First of all, we saw that confessing your sin gets sin out of your life if you forsake it. Then we say, whoever's God, you, you confess, that's the God you get. And, I mean, you confess some idol, you're out for curses, because idols bring curses. But if you confess the Lord Jesus, you, and if you confess his word, whatever you say about you is exactly what Jesus is saying. If you're saying, by his stripes, I am healed, he's up there before the Father saying, by, by my stripes, they were healed. Yeah. Did you know what they call the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews? Look at Hebrews 3.1. He's called the high priest of our confession. Yeah. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now, it's been years I've wondered what that really meant. But you see, what does a high priest do? A high priest takes your offerings and presents them before God in a holy way so that they can be received. Well, your offering is to say the same thing about you that God says, that you're more than a conqueror, that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He takes your offering, your confession of faith, I believe, God, that it will be exactly as I was told, and he offers it to the Father and say, they're believing you for a miracle. He's your high priest. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Doesn't it make you want to get your healing? You see, if you say, the Lord's going to heal me someday, no, he won't. He will never heal you someday. He healed you in his yeah. sight 2,000 years ago at that whipping post. Before he ever went to the cross and paid for our sins, he stood to be flogged, and he let his back be made hamburger out of it. And it says, by his 39 stripes, you were healed. Yeah. 
And so you can't wait for God to heal you. You have to accept it by faith and appropriate it by faith. A high priest takes the offering of your confession and presents it to God. Our confession of faith is an offering. And it says that we, if we hold it fast, there's a great reward. Look at Hebrews 10, 23. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, what does that mean in real life? Well, first of all, right now you're holding fast your confession that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he is your Savior. There will come a day when he comes for us or we go home and we will have our new bodies. And there will be no going back. We will be sealed for all eternity and we will be saved. But right now, you are in the process of holding. If somebody were to try to get you to deny the Lord, you say, no, there's no amount of money and no gun that would make me deny Jesus. I hold, are you following? We hold fast the confession. But then when it comes to the enemy trying to afflict your finances or afflict your body, you're right here in Matthew, or are you? No, I just left the stuff. Matthew, go to Matthew 8, 17. The reason the word is so precious to us is because this word was given to us to change our lives. And you know, it might, a lot of people, they really think you take the word, the power of your word overboard. So you have to understand, we were made in the image of God. Now the only place where, where, where do we differ from God? We're not sovereign. He's sovereign. Yeah. He gets to decide the plan for our lives. Yeah. He, we don't come to him and tell him what to do. He tells us what to do. Hallelujah. He said, oh, I don't like that you would if you knew how much he loved you. Amen. Yeah. But God made us in his image. When God wanted to create them something, he did not take his hands and create it. He said, he looked right out in the darkness. He didn't like the darkness. He said, light be. And it said that the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the earth and the light became. He creates everything with his works. This Bible is the living word of God. And, when, and it says that he, the second person of the Trinity, the living word of God, was with the Father from time before there was time. You know, eternity passed. He was always with the Father. Then that eternal living word of God took on flesh so that he would have a body to offer as a sacrifice for us. But you see, we were made in the image of that one who uses words to create. Satan uses words to curse. He tries to get us to use our words to curse other people. Now that doesn't necessarily like me like you. It just means saying evil things to say about it. In Spanish, the word curse is maldecir. And maldecir simply means to say something bad about. And I love that because people don't realize, they think that word curse is so strong if you have to use a cuss word to curse. No, if I'm really gossiping about someone and telling the worst I know, or if I'm saying, look, I don't think they're ever gonna get their life straightened out, I just curse them. Why? Because I'm not using my faith. You have faith to use on people's behalf or your behalf. You have fear or evil. You see? Okay, where are we now? Let's suppose that Jesus just wrote the book the way he meant it. It means exactly what it says. If you go back a verse, he was healing a whole lot of people. Can you go back to eight, verse 16? It's very that hard. It says, when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with the word and healed how many who were ill? Oh, there was never one person who ever came to Jesus Christ and said, I need healing. And he said, no, I don't think I want to, or it's not Father's will. He healed them all. Why did he heal them all? The next verse says it. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. If you read Isaiah 53, it describes exactly. Do you want to read Isaiah 53? I know this might be new to some people. If you want to read it, it'll strengthen your faith for healing. Yeah. Go to Isaiah chapter 53. Because you have to get it to where you see that this is so true that you start holding on. Dad Hagen always said this, Brother Kenneth Hagen. He said, When you find out something in the Word and you see that it's really yours, then you hold on to your confession like a pit bull with a T bone. Yeah. Would you like to wrestle a T bone away from a pit bull? Me neither. And that's exactly what the devil ought to have to do with you once you just stop. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to hell for anybody. Jesus is my Lord, and if, if, if we got invaded, they were going to shoot me. I still say Jesus is my Lord. I intend to spend eternity with him. That's what, what it means to hold on to your confession like a pit bull with a T-bone. But you see, the Bible is very clear that our healing was purchased. 
Now, in Isaiah 53, let's look at verse 4. It says, surely our griefs he himself bore. There's a, a note on my Bible and it says sickness. If you go back and study the Hebrew, and we don't have time here, but if you go back and study the Hebrew, every other place that this word in Hebrew is used, it was translated sickness. Surely our sicknesses he himself bore, and our sorrows, or that could be translated pains, he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. Okay? Why did he have nails in his hands? Because of our sin. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment for our well-being. That word well-being is shalom. Just like the Jewish people say shalom. Shalom it means total and complete health and well-being. The punishment for our total and complete health and well-being fell on him. And by his scourging we are healed. Now that is in the present time. If you'll go to 1 Peter 2.24, it says, By his scourging we were healed. The, it, you know the two verses I'd like to compare right now, Dan, is um, Isaiah 53, verse 4. This is the Old Testament that Matthew quoted. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves estranged him, stricken, spent of God, and afflicted. Now go to Matthew 8, 17. It says, this was to fulfill what was written by Isaiah the prophet. Surely our sicknesses he himself bore... Surely he himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Different translations. But you see, what I'm trying to get you to see here is the prophet, looking ahead at Calvary, said when he gets scourged, he's going to take care of the sickness. Looking back, Matthew said, the reason he healed all those people was to fulfill what, what Isaiah wrote. He took our infirmities and carried our sicknesses. Now it's a done deal. Yes. And he said, if it was a done deal, everybody that's a Christian would be healed. Well, Everybody that you know that doesn't serve God and has no use for God, they are potentially saved. Their price has been paid. He does not, when you come down and kneel and say, I give my life to you, I want to be born again, he doesn't have to go run and die on the cross again. You know why? He paid for the, the salvation of every human being that ever lived. And in the same way, the healing has been paid for. But just as salvation has to be received, healing has to be received. Okay? Once you see that it really is in the atonement and it's yours, and you've been carrying a sickness and you've been being robbed by a devil that is already defeated, at some point, you go back and you study, you think about the scriptures we've looked at so far. In Psalm 32, David said, I confess my sin and found mercy. What have he changed his life by the confession of his mouth? Yes or no? Yeah. And then we went to Isaiah where he said, we've had... Many gods rule over us, but we will confess your name. When you confess the God of your life, you put his covering and lordship over your life. You get blessed if it's Jesus. If it's an idol, you get cursed. Can everybody see that so far confession has changed in your life? Yeah. Now, how in the world do you receive this, um, healing? Go to If you're in Isaiah, or how many of you have the Bible open to Isaiah? Let's look at verse 5 again, because Peter quotes verse 5. It says, he was pierced through our, for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The first half of that verse said, guess what? He paid for your sins. Thank God. The second half said, the punishment for your healing fell on him. And it says it twice. Now, I've explained this before. But in the Hebrew, they didn't have capital letters. They didn't have exclamation marks. You couldn't underline. They had no kind of punctuation whatsoever. So when they really wanted to emphasize something, and they couldn't make it bold, they said it twice. It's called parallelism. Now look at the second half of the verse. He, Isaiah simply says it twice for emphasis. The chastening for our shalom, our well-being, our wholeness fell on him. By scourging, we are healed. Now if that says that in the New Testament too, wouldn't you think that we can believe what it says? Go to 1 Peter 2.24. First Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. How many of us believe that? Yeah. We, we believe, okay? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. In other words, we could be born again and live holy before it. Now look at the second part. For by his wounds you were healed. He quotes that whole verse. Healing is part of the atonement, but you have to grasp it and hold on to it just like you do salvation. Now, that... 
That's the, are you following the confession part? Because people just be allowed. If you say, guess what? You can have what you say. You say, that's dumb. But you already, now watch. You say, why do you have so much power in your mouth? Because when Adam was created, he was created in the image of God. The power was in his mouth, just like the power was in God's mouth. He wasn't God. He couldn't rule the whole universe with his words. What part of the universe was given to man? The earth. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, Psalm 115 says, but the earth is given to the sons of men. As long as he was not in sin, this earth, he said, God brought the animals and said, what do you want to call them? And Adam named it every animal. It was in his tongue, and then he fell. But you, are you following so far? When Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law, he got our authority back. Now that doesn't mean you have authority over other people. Witches, they try to take authority over other people. You don't have authority over whether another family moves to Texas or not. You don't have authority over anybody else's free will. You know why? Because within your sphere of influence, you're sovereign. That's why Jesus says, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess him before the Father. If you're saying, my God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, Jesus is standing before the Father agreeing with you. Why? Because within your sphere of influence, you're the boss. Let's go to Hebrews 4.14. We're going to talk just a little bit more about him being a high priest. People in the New Testament who are highly successful simply believe what God said and they said it boldly with their mouths. If, you, if all you did was just say every day, God loves me. Yeah. God cares for me. You say, well, how do I know that? Because it says so in the Bible. The reason the Bible is precious is it tells us the truth that we can establish in our lives. Hebrews 4.14 Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Now why, why do we hold fast the confession? Of? Well, first and foremost, obviously, that Jesus is our Lord, and that we're born again, that we're under his protection. It says in Psalm 91 that he gives his angels charge concerning you. We hold fast our confession. I don't, I'm not afraid. Oh my goodness. Somebody gave us a vacation. Don't be mad to go on a vacation. Somebody gave it to us. Thank you, Jesus. My parents decided they would take us over to the Thanksgiving Day. They want to go zip line. In my whole entire universe, I never wanted to zip line over the canopy of anything. I love to go. And so they said, oh, well, if you're afraid, you can't go. Well, I can't say I don't want to go because I'm afraid. I'm not afraid of anything. You said you're lying. Hallelujah. Well, I know, I, no, I'm not afraid. Parts, I know. I'm not, you said everybody's afraid of something. Not if you know the blood of Jesus. Yeah. The blood of Jesus. And you say, well, I know the blood of Jesus, and I'm still afraid. Now, listen, and you have never boldly taken what is yours and yeah. spoken it. The way you claim your salvation is to say, look, I'm going to confess my sin and get it out of my life. Whatever sin you had to confess, you confessed it, right? Okay, confess the sin. Change your life with your confession, yes or no? Yeah. And then you say, Jesus, you are my Lord. According to the scripture we read in Romans 10 and 9, whoever shall confess Jesus as Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. Now you say, well, I'm still afraid. That's because. How many of you say, I, I have confessed sin, God out of my life. I have confessed Jesus. Okay, however far you're willing to go, that's how far you're going to live. If you ever see that the blood of Jesus totally separated you from that ugly enemy that got us in the Garden of Eden, got us to rebel against God, and that you have been separated from rebellion and separated from sin, separated from fear, then what you do is you take this word and you put it in your mouth and you establish, yeah, I was ziplining and I'm not afraid of nothing. Amen? Amen? And you say, I bet you're afraid of public speaking. I would have went for the blood of Jesus. I'm not afraid of public speaking. I'm not afraid of you. And you say, isn't this a terrible way to live? It's the most marvelous. Yeah. But guess what? Until you establish it with your mouth, you can have healing if you'll establish it. Yep. Yeah. i got to forget. Yep. Hallelujah. We were made in his image, and he said, whatever you say, if you confess me before men, I'm going to be standing before the throne of God saying, Father, they're believing for their healing. You've got them for it. They, they're saying they're healed. Isn't that how you got healed of cancer, Bill? Hallelujah. Is there any difference between what I'm saying? He, he had the cancer and wasn't supposed to be here right now. What for you? And I, you know, yeah. so Sherry. Sherry's doing the play. Hallelujah. And you know what they did is they saw it in the Word. They literally saw it. Nobody can see it for you. No. Your pastor can teach it. And other people can see. And when you see that it's yours, just like salvation is yours, you will never take, spend one more day saying, well, 
Someday. No, someday's not going to happen. Now. It says, by his stripes, we were healed. Amen. Oh, well. I'm sorry. It's better than being sick. All right. Hebrews 10, 35 says, don't throw away your confidence. Like Brother Hagin said, hold on to your confession. Now, let me give you, look, look at Luke 12, 8, 9. We've only got five more minutes. But have you learned anything? Your, your words are so important. Your words are going to affect your destiny. And you say, well, I can see confessing sin. And I can see confessing Jesus. But this says, I can show you all the way through. The Apostle Paul, how many of you believe the Apostle Paul probably knew what he was talking about? Mm -hmm. He took any promise God gave him and just confessed it as both. He said, in all these things, we overwhelmingly come for yeah. the one who loved us. And he was the greatest faith giant in the valley. Because if you can see it, that's wonderful. You've got to believe in your heart. But then you can stop and start saying it. Yeah. Where were we? Luke 12, 8 and 9. Jesus is saying this. Luke quotes it slightly different. And I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And I ask you, what in the world do you care what he's saying to the angels? Would you like to know why you should care what he's saying to the angels? It tells us in Psalm 103, Psalm 103, 20 to 21. How many believe there are angels? They're doing something. Well, they're, they're... Okay, here he says he's going to confess you before the angels. Psalm 103, David wrote, Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him, doing his will. Do you know what angels do? Angels do God's word. So this is how it works. Let's suppose, I'm trying to think of something we might really be afraid of. I can't think of it. Okay? But anyhow, you're going on a experiment and you're going to take Psalm 91. It says he will give his angels charge concerning you. I think it's to guard you in all your ways lest you stick, um, stub your foot even or strike your foot on, on a rock. Yep. You're in a scary situation and you're holding fast your confession. Yep. And you say, Father, Lord Jesus, I believe that you give your angels charge concerning me to guard me in all my ways. I, I prayed over my kids more than I do. Me. I've been in for a lot of years, but I still prayed over them and tried. Okay, you know what I I believe that you give your angels charge over Christiana and Nathan as they drive. Thank you, Lord. Now, what is Jesus saying? Whoever confesses, he's saying it to the angels. Yeah. They go back to verse. It says, it's, it says um, you who serve him, obeying the voice of his word. So he said, if you're going to say that over them, I'm going to say it over them in heaven. I'm going to say to the angels, Denise Mark is believing that I give angels charge over your kids. Go down and take care of them. Amen. You're releasing power. Yeah. And you say, why do I have to release it? Because you're made in the image of God. God said you can have the life you want. You choose. Yep. And uh, do I know Christians that live in here? Yes, but it's not important. It's not um, the way it has to be. Matthew 12, 36 to 37 seems so overstated. <coughs> Jesus said this in Matthew 12, 12 26. He said... I tell you, every careless word, and that word careless, if you look in the Greek, it means idle, useless, inoperative. You could say good for nothing word. Boy, this will make you stop and think, won't it? Every good for nothing word that people speak, they're going to have to account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. You know, when we prayed for a little Alex tonight, and I got to quit calling him little Alex, baby Alex, growing fast. Hallelujah. But when we prayed for him, we didn't just do that to be sweet. We did that to change his future. All right? We did that so that when they hook the right part of the intestine together, he's going to live and get nutrition. By your, why, why do you, if you go back one verse, why, when you stand before the Father, is he going to ask you about Eric? Well, I mean, it's not wrong to tell a joke. But if 80 to 85% of your time is spent telling jokes, Brother Peg would always tell him about this preacher friend he had. And he said, this man knew more jokes. He said, I can't tell a joke, but it's not like I get the punchline. I forgot the punchline. But Brother Peg can quote scripture. This man would always say, I don't know how. You, I thought you were going to quote half the Bible up there tonight. I just can't remember the Bible. And he said, well, you sure can't remember jokes. What's important to you, you're going to find a way to remember. Yeah. Now, why is it that every useless, idle, inoperative, careless, good-for-nothing word that we speak because 
You were made in the image of God. And if you watch how Jesus used his words, he was always creating something. He was always creating life. He was always bringing blessing. He was always bringing instruction that brought new revelation. Okay? We are so much... Think about this. Why do we have to make our words count? Because just as Adam was sovereign within his sphere of influence, you and I are to be sovereign within our sphere of influence. Even after we get to where we're growing God, we still use our words against ourselves to a certain degree. If yeah. you listen carefully, okay? Look at, you say, is that possible? Look at what Hebrews 1.3 says about Jesus. It says he's upholding everything with the word of his power. Remember that? I, when I saw this, when we were studying this about three weeks ago, we talked about being made in his image, right? It says, he, Jesus, is the radiance of the Father's glory. The exact representation of his nature. Upholding all things by the word of his power. Now, I've got really good news for you. You don't have to uphold all the things. You don't have to uphold the stars. No. You don't have to uphold Australia or Africa. But guess what? In your little world, see, how many of you have a life in the sphere of influence where you make decisions? Yeah. In that sphere of influence, you are to uphold all things. And you say, how do you do that? Well, when something comes up and it scares you and, and it's a situation you never intended to deal with, you say, well, my father was looking after that. Yeah. You say, you don't have scripture for that. Psalm 138 verse 8 says, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. That means if you, and you yeah. say, look it, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Yeah. And you say, you can't just take a word. Well, let me ask you this. Did you take a verse of scripture that said, Jesus is Lord, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Did you take one verse of scripture and go from hell to heaven? Yeah. Yeah, you sure did. Did you take one time and say, I confess that sin? You got sin out of your life. You can change your, the circumstances of your daily life. Don't, don't just make stuff up. I've got to be here. Two minutes. Don't just make stuff up off the cuff. Find out what the Bible says. The yeah. Bible has promises that are way better than anything you can make oh up. I, I'm serious. If, Amen. How many of you believe that if, all, if you could believe for one word, week, just for one week, I'm going to take Psalm 138, verse 1, first half, and I'm going to believe that the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Yeah. First thing I'd ask is what's concerning you at the moment. If I give you a piece of paper in less than five minutes, you could give me the top four things that are concerning you. Yeah. All of us could. Because it's what we think of that. It's what at the top of our heart, you know, our consciousness. Yeah, I wish I had done it. But anyhow, yeah, pretend. Give you a piece of paper. Uh, Write down the top four things that are concerning you. Uh, what if for one week you could hold that to your confession? You say, how do I know it's right? Because it's written. Yeah. I, I wish I had taken the time. There just wasn't time tonight. Jesus quoted scripture authoritatively, constantly, ascendingly, setting all matters. Yeah. When the devil said, why don't you turn that stone into bread? You're so hungry. He said, it is written, man shall not live. As soon as he said that, that was the stuff. That was the end of it. Yeah. It is written, the Lord will accomplish what concerns me. And the devil says, but you're really, really, really concerned about this one. But if for one, one week, you could take that T-bone, and you could be the pit bull. I say, okay, for, for this week, that's my scripture. Maybe you got a better scripture for you. This one would do real good for me, I think. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how everybody's going to get along where I've gone. I mean, you'll get along, but will, how many things am I forgetting, right? All right, this is going to be my scripture. The Lord yeah. will take care of. The, the King James there says perfect. The Lord will perfect what concerns me. Yeah. Everybody say that. The Lord, the Lord will perfect what concerns me. Perfect. You can read the... The life of Paul, an angel appeared to him. They had been in a shipwreck or a storm for like three weeks. They were all dying. It didn't look like any hope. And he stood before them and he said, an angel of God has appeared to me and told me that every one of us is going to live. And he said, wherefore, brethren, I believe God that it will be exactly. When you just lift up your voice and say, I believe God that I am, that by his stripes I'm healed. Yeah. You've got a right to say that. Sure. And not wait on your healing, but get it right now. I accept it by faith. I believe God that the Lord concerns me, will perfect what concerns me. And um, last thing I want to say, the enemy desperately wants you to say, well, I'll just think it. Oh. But thinking it isn't saying it. No. God didn't think, like me, like me. He said, like me. Yeah. You know why? Because the power's in your tongue. It says so. Read it. Okay. John, you want to leave us a prayer?